change really in that. If uh, I can say, it is good to be alive. All right. On this day that the uh, world has set aside to celebrate mothers. Amen. It is worthy because of what we do so tirelessly. But we go on anyway. We just like the energizer bunny. <laughs> it's just keep on ticking. We don't give out. We get we get tired and we just take a deep breath and get up and go again. But anyway, back to this lesson. Yeah, we know mothers are supposed to be weak, but we are some strong sisters. Yes, ma'am. And to you also have a mother's day. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And I got that beautiful flower. I don't need to know how to keep it. <laughs> I need to know how to keep it in my phone somewhere. So in my picture gallery. Okay. So far, this, uh, let me just do this over. Uh, I'm getting it. Isaiah, often hope for the future. And the subtitle is Empty Rituals Are Useless. Mm. And like I said, that's what we're talking about, about empty rituals when we worship. But before I get to that, I want to say this. Or as we continue our study of the prophets faithful to God's covenant, and throughout this spring quarter, we have studied faithful prophets who was willing and had the courage, regardless of their situation or their surrounding. During their time, they remained faithful to God and his word and delivered the message just as God had told them to. Then we look at the prophets of restoration and what it was, he was calling them to repent and to be restored and turn back to God and obey his commandment. We've also looked at the prophets who had the courage to bring about a change by speaking the truth to power. And if you look at all of these prophets before I get into today, well, let me just say this. Today we see Isaiah is calling out the nation of Judah for its empty ritualistic worship. And we're gonna get into whys and the wherefores and why this happened. But if we can take and take a panoramic view of the lessons that we have looked at in this quarter, even in the midst of all of the evilness and the waywardness that was going on, God always had that one somebody that he could go to and they were, he wasn't afraid and he stood firm and saying, what thus say the Lord? And that is the message to us as leaders and Christians we must be willing, dedicated, and committed to standing firm on the truth of God's word. That's, that's, that's where we are. So when I was looking at this lesson, going through this lesson, this question came to mind. What would cause Israel to turn from true worship to empty ritualistic rituals in their worship when I mean, they call themselves worshiping when they was worshiping the one true god let me rephrase it what caused israel to fall so far by the wayside in its worship and that it would became just empty rituals that they were going through do you want us to answer that mm -mm, not yet okay. we're gonna go through it good morning and how are you we got <laughs> so and when we get through the lesson, I'm going to get to where we can give your input on that, because that was a question, and I'm raising this question so we can get into this lesson. Before I get to there, though, I want to take a look at who is Isaiah? Who is Isaiah? Well, he was a Hebrew prophet who lived, uh, who was believed to have lived some 700 years before the birth of Christ because he is the one that prophesied about the coming Messiah. Uh, he was born in Jerusalem and was self-ed. He was, he was, he, he saw his vision 
you know, uh, and the year that King Uzziah died. We, we just looking at who Mr. Isaiah is and how his prophecy was, was so profound as he uh, prophesied again about the coming Messiah. And we see when we read over in the New Testament, everything that Isaiah prophesied about the coming Christ was fulfilled, okay? His ministry is dated back between, let me cut this off, because these folks from over yonder is going to be called and being, that's not going to work. Uh, when I say <laughs> over yonder, that's broken English. I'm over in the mother countries, eh? way in the evening and we in the morning time. His prophecy was dated between 740 to 739 or 700 BC and the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign. He is a prophet that predicted that Judah would eventually be, defeat, be defeated because of their prolonged sin, but they would ultimately be redeemed and restored back to their fruitfulness. Okay, now, what he did was, Isaiah, he tried in vain to discourage the southern kingdom or to persuade them from his false belief that there was nothing was going to happen to them because they was God's people and it was inhabited by the city of David. You'll find that in Isaiah 28 and verses 16 through 17. So what did I say? The people of Judah felt because they was God's chosen people. They could sin and do anything they wanted to do. And God loved them so much that he would not punish them. Okay, that's, that's it's the late Solomon, Reverend Solomon, sis, you say, that's that high-headedness that you see. Mm. <laughs> you know, and what my point is of that is, many times we get caught up in our own deceit, believing that because we are special to God, he will not punish us for our sin. Well, newsflash, mm. God is just and he punishes sin regardless of who what, of the sin or who's committing the sin. Yes, I'm a child of God. You are a child of God. All of us who believe are children of God. But when we get out of line and we don't correct that ship and turn it around and get back in God's good graces and start doing things according to his laws and his commandments, guess what? We are going to be punished. He says, I will chastise my own. Even if I don't, then you are not of me. So, and with Judah and their false belief, or uh, false, false sense of security, they kept on with their sinful ways. And guess what? The day came that they had to face the music of God's wrath for their unrepentant sin for breaking his covenant agreement with them at Sinai, Mount Sinai. And what did I say? Wake up, America. Because if we do not get it right, yes, we are a blessed nation. We are a Christian nation. But we have become so worldliness until our religious worship has become empty. Okay? Now, so... Go back to my first question. What caused the nation to fall into empty ritualistic worship? Well, let's look at it from this perspective. When God blesses us, as he does, oftentimes we forget about who's the, where the blessings is coming from. Yeah. And we get focuses uh, we keep all our focus on the blessing themselves. He blesses us financially. He blesses us health-wise. He blesses us in so many ways. Tell we must forget about it is all of God's doing. And we forget about him. And then we will fall in to Satan's traps of uh, forgetting about the blessed all. And that's a part of Satan's schemes 
but we are never to forget or get caught up until in our blessings till we forget where they come from. We should never forget because God must remain first in our lives. And in all that we are, or all that we hope to become, comes from God. We owe everything to God. So in, in, in expressions of gratitude for his blessings, we must always keep him in focus. And we are commanded to worship him in spirit and in truth. That has not changed, and it will not change. So we see here the nation was caught up in all these rituals, and they become meaningless to us, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where our lesson text uh, picks, picks up. And then without meaning in our worship, they are useless and they are empty. Let me just read what uh, verses 13 through uh, 14 says. Uh, he said, Isaiah calls out the nation for their worship. He said, wherefore, the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have moved their hearts far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precepts of men. What is he saying here? That God is saying to the nation of, of Israel uh, through Isaiah, I see your lips moving. I see your head worship, but your heart is far from me. See, God wants our heart when we come to worship him. He doesn't worry about what order the service is. He could care less about what order the service is. He could care less about Who's on program? All he wants to know is your, when you come to worship me, I want your heart and your spirit touch my spirit. That's what he wants. So we see this. Uh, and he, was, he called them out for, you got these special days that's coming up, these feast days that's coming up. And they were observing. But they were so full of ritualist, rituals that they had no meaning to them. And, and okay, we have our special days going on. And we get so caught up in who's doing what on the program, how well they perform, and whatever that day is, is more about that than worshiping God. And I'm meddling, and I know I'm meddling, and I'm going to say it anyway. God is not moved by that kind of worship. He wants us to remain faithful and true to him in our worship. He doesn't, he's not worried about the sanctuary being filled with flowers. And flowers cannot worship God on this program. He, it, how is the decoration is going to be? How is the decoration is going to worship him? You know, yeah, he has nature that worship him. But when we get so caught up, then we can outdo this group, outdo that group, and decorate the sanctuary. Where is our focus? Is it on decoration or on worship? Is it is, is it on worship or is it on decoration? Well, and the point I'm trying to ask, I'm trying to get over, is this. It's past time for us as Christians to get caught up in rituals. In, God is not at the forefront of our worship, then we're playing game. And we don't need to get caught up like Judah. That's what these lessons is teaching us. Let's not get caught up. We see their mistakes. Let us just don't walk down that path, okay? Let's just make sure when we go and worship God, it is in truth, and in spirit. It doesn't matter if it's a regular Sunday morning. That still is the Sabbath that God sanctified and set aside to worship him. Yeah, we have our different days. Like we getting this church is getting ready for anniversary. My home church is getting ready for its anniversary. It's the 
anniversary is a remembrance of where you came from and not about all of these theatrical performances and decorations. Okay? It's not about that. It is giving thanks and reverence to God that we have made it from this time last year to this time this year. It is a remembrance. And if anybody known me and has talked, I know that I'm not so hung up on this day and that day. Uh, pastor's anniversary and building fund and nurses and mission and all that kind of days. I'm concerned about one day. That is the anniversary of this church, where it come from and where we want to go with God's blessings and his faith. And if we walk with him, we'll get there. The churches had it been around, hopefully they have been walking by faith with God because Christ is the head of the church. Now, what are you saying about quit fussing? I'm not, I'm just telling it. Like, I'm just telling it like it is. It was like you said, and I think this is where we fall short at. We are the church. That's exactly we right. Look at it, and this is why God is looking for us to worship. Because although we have a physical building, technically we are the church. Because if you look at it now, we're at a church. We're, where's the building now? It's, it's a building that's sitting on a prime property. And right now, the majority of them are empty. So well, there's no one inside the actual physical building uh, worshiping. There's no decoration going on. There's well, no feast put together for after the services or whatever. And this is why I think sometimes we fall short. Like you said, we get caught up into the celebration itself. And you can get caught up and you and it's nothing wrong with, you know, celebrating and, and, and being in fellowship. But the main thing is not to forget the, the main reason why we how we got to where we are even as a people we need to look at how far we have come look and in the, and people need to look back in their own individual life and see just where has god brought you from even from now a year ago to even today yes yeah, true so we got there we get to this empty worship by failing to keep our focus on who we are worshiping and who brought us this far? And that's all Isaiah was telling the nation. Mm -hmm. And he tried to get them to adhere to what he's saying, to what he was trying to tell them. Just because you are God's chosen people, but if you do not worship him in spirit and in truth and keep your end of the covenant agreement, God is going to punish you. That didn't change from that day, some of them many years ago until the day it has not changed. I have a question. Um, hold on one second. Oh, hold on one second. I, I know you was full of questions. I know you. Uh, hold on one second for me. But what was I saying? He, all he was trying to do is do some preventive measures for the people of that, of that day and time just like those of us, and not just the leaders, but laity, if you're really committed, well, let me phrase it, if we are really committed to worshiping in truth and in spirit, you're going to make sure your focus when we come together in a church setting. It, of course, when God Christ come back for his church, he's not coming back for no building. He's not going to care where it's located, if it's in the deep in the ghetto, or if it's on prime time, or wherever it is, if he's coming back for every believer who is in Christ, then in our heart is focused on him. Now, let me just start and ask you ask your question so I can kind of keep moving on. What's your okay, question? The question would be is that considering that the generations before them were brought out of captivity, it's like it's almost like history keeps repeating itself. It is. So if and I'm sure they passed down the stories and the history. So how did this that generation get caught up and be captive again? Since you, you would have thought that they would have learned from past mistakes. Okay, well, let me answer it this way. Remember when Joshua took over and uh, the leadership, Moses was dead. 
And when they crossed the Jordan, right, and he told them, he said, make me 12 stones. Those stones was going to be a memorial for where they come from out of captivity. And he told them specifically, he said, when generations after you come, we have to keep telling this story for generations and generations. Let's go back to, he said, he said, just because you are God, let me go back to Isaiah. He told him, he told the people this, just because you are God's people, and he, you're living in the city of David, but you made an agreement in Sinai that you would not worship false gods. You would not have any other gods before him. Somewhere between Joshua and that generation, they, they stopped telling the story or they, the listeners stopped believing the story and started thinking that's old folkism. And that's the same thing that's happening to us today. And right. if you can look at the church services during my day and in your early days where people came to church dressed to the nines yes. and they came there with their focus on worshiping God. They didn't have all of the, the musical instruments and in Bible study and prayer meeting, that's why it was called Bible, prayer meeting and Bible study. They would have a rocking good time. And I'm using that rock because it would be spirit filled. This deacon would get up and sing a song and pray a prayer. This sister over here would get up and sing a song and pray a prayer. And he went on for about a half an hour. And now many places, the only if they sing a song and read a scripture and have a prayer, that's it. Some of them don't do nothing but pray and do a scripture. If we are getting too out of order with our worship service and uh are we getting to get into what to the question I'm I'm getting ready to lead into mm -hmm. is that if we got we as believers, even modern day believers, God's commandments did not change. He gave them to that group in Sinai, but he gave them for us to also for us to abide by. So if we fail to teach the truth of where we came from because we all was in captivity to a point when we, for we were accepted Christ as our savior, okay? We were all captive to sin, okay? We was captive to sin and slave to him. Jesus delivered us. And if you can put that in a physical context, Moses, that's like Moses physically delivered the nation of Israel out of Egypt. We have been delivered out of sin's captivity by believing Jesus Christ. Okay, so now let me go on to 14. He said, behold, I will proceed. Now he's asking them, he's telling them, if you come back to me and put me first and get rid of all of this worldly, empty rituals, I will do a great thing, a marvelous work for my people, even a work and a wonderful, even the wise men will understand. All of these, this worship that you are doing is, is, is meaningless, but I want you to come back to me so I can bless you. But let's see what he said here in verse 15 and 16. He said, woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. See, we have all this plotting going on, and they, they're foolish enough to feel that I can do this and God will not see. God is all-knowing. Well. Nothing escapes his all-seeing eye. See, we talked a little bit this, about this in this lesson last week, when man is so foolish, he feels like he can, or what is the Bible story, that he can sin and God won't know about it. Well, I just don't, I can't get to that understanding. And I really, I'd be all here all day if I tried to figure it out. So I, let me just say, I don't understand it, but it escapes me that man and his limited knowledge will think that we can do something and hide it from God. Yes, yeah, we can hide things from other people because they're human like we are, but we can't hide nothing from God. And he said they was trying to 
the scheme is so that they is turning the world upside down. And then what they was trying to do is, and in this verses, he said, he used the clay and the potter scenario. He said, look, you trying, it's just like the clay gonna tell the potter how to shape me, or this is how I want to be made. That's why, mm -hmm. and so when we look at the, the worship part of, he said, we gonna tell God, no, this is how I want to be worshiped. This is how I'm gonna worship you. And the potter in this instance is God himself. He well. molding and shaping the clay. So who is the, the clay gonna tell God how to shape him? That is so absurd that the Judah, this nation will try and to reverse the order of creation, knowing full well that God created everything, okay? And all that was created was created by God. And it was nothing that was created that wasn't created by God, okay? Let me, let's just take us a, a nice little in-depth look at some of this so we can go on. God created human. He created man and woman in such a way that regardless of what man tried to do or change humanity's creation, he's going to fail. Okay, man and his vile attempts to create robots to replace human, he gonna fail at that too. God created humanity and man cannot replace or duplicate a man other than through a man and woman coming together through a, a, uh, to create a child, through childhood. That takes a male and female, I don't care how society going to convince you that a man and another man can come together and be a family, a husband and wife. It's just not so. Or two women, even when those two same sex get ready for a child, they have to go to the opposite sex to come to get one. So where is their thinking that the two same sex can come and have a child? I don't get it. Okay, now, I don't care how we try, we, men in humanity, try to reverse the order of God's creation. They're going to fail at it every time. I don't care how the attempts that they do, they're going to fail, okay? And when God uses, when he uses the potter and the clay image to show the foolishness of man to try to reverse the order of creation. And as I said, the image is that the clay is trying to tell the part, part is God, how to create and shape things and how he wants to shape. This is what we see going on in society today. So you said, well, what does it have to do with worship? Because we have gotten so liberal in our worship till everything goes except true worship of the one true God. And he said, no, you are not going to change my order of worship. I don't care what you do. He can make it, he can do whatever you can want to. You can have as many musical instruments as you want to. But if your heart is not fixed on me, it's going to fail you every single time. So even in the midst of man's foolishness and his tomfoolery, that God is his love and kindness always give us hope for a brighter day, you know? And when he says, and I'm in verse 17 through 21, he said, it is not yet a little while that Lebanon shall be turned to a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. That means he's gonna make them plentiful and they're gonna flourish, but he's asking us, asking them to repent and turn back to him and get rid of all this empty realist, ritualistic kind of worship. And he said, in that day, the deaf will hear the words, the blind will see out of obscurity and out of darkness. God is promising restoration for his people. All that was lost will become fruitful again. 
And let me just make this, this point right here. Even when we turn back to God in our true meaningful worship, let me tell you something. The church is, is going to be running over. And I'm not speaking of a physical building either. I'm speaking of whatever platform that that church is coming together. When we can get out of all of this empty, ritualistic kind of worship or head worship and no heart worship, when we put the heart back in it, it is going to be fruitful because God's spirit and he's going to be in the midst of it. And he's going to be such a shouting and praising God going on until the folks on the street or the drunks or whatever are going to want to come and see. And they're going to come to Christ because the church as a whole will have drawing power. Okay. When I say the church, I'm talking about each local congregation, wherever it is, however format it is, is going to be so powerful and spirit filled. It's going to be like that uh, overflowing of the banks of the river. Because it's going to spill out. Everybody want to come and take, you know, when a lot of stuff happening is going on, people in that human nature will want to see what's going on. That's right. They will want to come and see. Even he said that the ones that are deaf are using as who does not believe, they will want to believe. They'll open up their deaf ears and begin to believe. Yes, there is a God. And even the ones who've been spiritually blind will put on their spirit-filled glasses and come and be, believe in faith that yes, and we begin to see him in their spiritual eyes, him who Christ who died for my sin. They will make it personal and say, yes, I'm coming to Christ. And when all of that is happening, we're going to become spiritually alive and we'll be able to manifest the fruits of the spirit joy, love, kindness, compassion, long suffering, and we'll be living in oneness with God. Our worship will then be so meaningful. And as we get, I got about four minutes, I'm trying to stay on task, on time here, is that it'll become so meaningful, but that it is going to be just like, you know how you, your garden, your grass and stuff would be so green and plentiful? It will be just that beautiful. Okay. And, but he said this, the last two verses, he talks about a day of redemption when every one going to call on the name of Jesus Christ and true reference for who he, who he is and his sovereign power. I can assure you, and I can't quote you the scripture right now when it said, every knee is going to bow. Those days are coming. And all of us, uh, Satan and running and, and ramping up and amping up his, his attacks on God's people and it's filling the world with sin and fooling so many people. Well, guess what? When we at the church get back to true worship, we're going to shine the light of Christ and his righteousness. So it's going to fill over and he's going to shine. You know, light always dispels darkness. So when he talks about those deaf ears and those blinded eyes, they're going to come open. And see, no, I'm traveling down this dark road and I is leading to destruction. Let me go right and where there's light, there's joy, there's love, there's peace, and there's happiness. Okay, and I won't have to be caught up in God's wrath when he come and judge the world. I'll be on the right side. And then we, we go all going to confess that, yes, Jesus Christ is Lord. So... And conclusion, just quickly. Mm -hmm. Believers must be careful not to confuse church membership and attendance with true discipleship. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that that's out of Philippians 2, 10 and 11, every day. Okay, okay. Yeah. thank you. Let me say that again. We today must be careful not to confuse church <laughs> membership and attendance with true discipleship. Christ need disciples, not just a membership. My name is on the road, okay? There's a big difference. 
And then we need to ask ourselves, am I a true worshiper of God or devoted to church worship and attendance? Or is my heart as focused on God or the order of the service? Mm. <laughs> All right. I, I, I want my heart to be focused on God and mm. let him direct the order of service. And let me close with this. I don't know where everybody's heart is. I know where it should be. It should be on God and our worship of him and in spirit and in truth. And our spirit, every believer's spirit, must connect with God's spirit. Then we're going to have true worship. And it's going to be such a glorified, spirit-filled time till Man's time of, hey, we got to get out of here at 1 o'clock. We got to get out of here at 12 o'clock. Whatever. That won't make a difference because we'd be shouting and praising God so till it won't make, that time won't even bother us. Okay? So, let me just say that concludes our lesson. If there's any questions or comments real quick? No, ma'am. No, ma'am? No, no question, no comment? No. No. Okay. Let 